welcome everybody in this week's seminar. We have a pleasure to, uh, to have Michał Eckstein from Jagiellonian University giving a seminar today. So Michał is uh, an expert on mathematical physics, non-commutative non geometry. Also, he works at intersect, at least he used to work or still works at the intersection of theory of gravity and quantum mechanics. So very exciting topics. But Michal actually works in our grant, but in Aguilonia University in Tibet. So I guess now he works, he does a bit more, let's say, down to the earth stuff. And he'll be telling us today about like how to, I guess, measure the, yeah, about quantum optimal transport. So some, some other way to measure distance between uh, quantum states. Like, this is what I gather. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So great to have you, Michal. The, the screen is yours. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Michal, for the invitation and for this very nice introduction. Well, indeed, I've been working and well, I still do on a bunch of different topics, but right now, officially, at least this is what I'm paid for, <laughs> is, the, is the quantum information theory. So I want to tell you about the quantum, quantum of computing. Transport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this, hopefully, we're going to come to that. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I want to uh, tell you about our joint work with um, with Sam Cole from from Missouri, Shmuel Friedland. He's a quite famous mathematician from Chicago. Well, and Karol Zhukovsky, whom you all know very well. By the way, I'm now in his office. He's not here. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, let me start from the beginning, which means 18th century. Um, and uh, well, it all started with um, with Gaspar Monge, uh, who asked the question, um, well, how do we move a pile of a sand? Say, suppose you have a pile of a sand here and you want to move it to some other place or just reshape it so that it has some different, different shape. And uh, well, the question is how, how are you going to do it optimally? Um, what it means optimally? Well, you want to minimize some cost, mm. some cost like, um, the cost of the transport. I mean, the, the the number of of ways back and through that you need to make, or, or whatever else you can imagine. Okay, so how do you do it? Well, how do you describe it mathematically? Well, first you need two spaces, probability spaces, with some probability measures on it. They can be continuous or discrete, whatever you wish. And then you need a cost function, which is a function from x and y to well, gives you a number um, greater or equal than, than zero. It can be infinite if you, well, you can have infinite penalty for some actions, why not? Uh, but then an easy example is that if you just take the same space and you take your cost function to be just a metric, well, then it's kind of natural, right? Uh, well, because you have some, some geometry in your, say, field or your valley and you need to make the transport so that it, it is optimal with respect to this geometry, the shaping of the land that you, well, that you are facing. The idea is that you have some, some transport plan. So you have some distribution of, on, on your space, on your initial space, you have a probability distribution. And then you have your final probability distributions. And the transport map is just a map that tells you how to transfer one to the other, okay? So this is just the condition that you really get at the end what, well, your your final, your final measure. Mm -hmm. okay, but so is this uh, is this transport like deterministic, let's say, or is it just some stochastic map? Yeah, yeah. So this is this is deterministic, and uh, this actually leads to the to the problem, because just to finish, so this is. The, the optimal transport, this is any transport, and optimal transport is a transport which minimizes the this integral. Okay? So this is hopefully understandable. But then there is a problem if you have a, suppose that in your initial state, you just have one grain of sand, okay? And your final, uh, say, distributions are two grains of sand at different places. Then there is no transport map that is going to do it for you because the transport map cannot divide the, uh, the the grains of sand. Okay, so there is no transport map here. Mm. 
Okay, well, because there is no function which has two values. It's, that's, that's the rough idea. So that's why uh, we need something more general. And this is called the, well, some, some, sometimes it's called the transference plan or a transport plan, which is in fact, maybe even easier to understand because, well, this is just a measure on your product space such that it's left marginal is your measure mu and it's right marginal is your measure nu, okay? So you need any, say, global measure, which is compatible with the local reductions, like on the initial and the final one, okay? Uh, and then this takes into account uh, also this situation, because sure, it's there is no transport map, it's just a, say, a bigger plan. Okay, and if you have this, you can uh, formulate the more general Kantorovich optimal transport problem, which means that you look at all the transference plans, so things with fixed marginals, uh, and while well, you take this double integral here, um, well, there should be y here, sorry, x times y, uh, so that, uh, well, and you, you take the integral with a given cost function, and the one that gives you the minimum is the optimal transference plan, right? Now, uh, suppose you have, uh, well, you have x equal y, so you have just the same space, and you have your cost function to be just a distance function. Yeah? Uh, sorry, I, I just, okay, I, I, I saw those formulations uh, like sometime earlier, but like, just naive question. So intuitively, I would imagine just like coming from, I, I mean, I understand well mathematically what is happening. I have a global probability distribution that I have uh, like marginals that, that agree yeah. and that's that's it. It's yeah. some the kind of- The marginals are fixed, right? Yeah. Some kind of refinement on like the marginal problem in a sense. Yeah. Like, uh, okay. And, but like intuitively that like for, for when I think about when I try to think about the transport problem, I would kind of imagine general, maybe stochastic strategies. Like, you know, I have uh, my pile of sand over there, like distributed somehow, like, okay, I maybe not like pile of like mass, right? And I want yeah. to kind of shift it to another location. So what I would do, I would go to every, and maybe I want to kind of on average be correct. So I would imagine that my strategy would be just kind of stochastic. No, uh, and I will be well, kind of transforming my measures according to some stochastic transformation. In, in, you know, or, yeah. yeah, well, but I'm not sure if this is going to give you the optimum. Well, it all depends what, what is your cost function because there are zillions of cost functions that you can- No, 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 I would optimize over, like, okay, in other words, I don't understand, I don't, I mathematically understand this Kantorovich formulation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just don't see a clear kind of operational interpretation of it in terms of like some procedure, right? That's maybe. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, that is. I think that is partially right because in the case of a Monge plan, you can think really in terms of a map that tells you mm -hmm. how to move one thing yeah. to another place. If you have just a transference plan, it's not really the case it's more like well you can of course draw it some kind of well and think of okay maybe i have my grain of a sand but i can cut it in two and this is more optimal than if i wouldn't do that uh but okay i, I think it's maybe useful to just look at it as a tool well by the way it's it, it's going to be even harder for the quantum case for which, uh, honestly, we don't have this really nice transport interpretation, but we do have uh, an interpretation in terms of, uh, you know, just comparing quantum states. Okay, so let me maybe go to Wasserstein distances because Wasserstein distance is just something, well, it's a distance. Uh, well, so if you have a distance function in your space, you can augment it to, the, to all probability distributions over the space. Okay, and it's going to be a nice, so, in other words, your well, your points in the space, these are just pure states, pure classical states, right? Just Dirac delta, right? And if you have uh, something distributed, like a probability distribution, well, it's a mixed state on your classical space. Uh, and then if you have a distance on your 
space, so on your pure states, you can always extend it to the to all mixed states, so to all probability measures, using this description by Wasserstein. Okay, so you take the piece power of your distance function, and then you take a square root of well or pth root of it, and that's always a distance. Okay, and this is this is used in many cases. Well, just if you have two abstract probability distributions and you want to say how close they are, for some reason. Okay, and this well, I I'm not an expert on applications on that, uh, but I know that people use it in in, in many fields. In uh, certainly in statistics, just to to compare the probability distributions, and in uh, well in economics and many different fields also in machine learning but this really i don't know i know they use it but don't, please don't ask me how <laughs> but somehow the, the punchline is that okay you don't really need to think of a kind of dynamical process there is a dynamical formulation of the optimal transport problem but here in general you don't need to think of it in terms of some like actual process process that is taking your one probability distribution to another you can just look at it as a tool. Well, suppose I have this probability distributions and I have another probability distributions and how close they are with respect to some conditions which you encode in this di distance. Okay, so that's that's the idea, hopefully. Okay, so, uh, so the discrete case, this discrete case is, uh, yeah, it's, uh, well, this comprises the discrete case, of course, but let me rewrite the discrete case in a way so that it's it's getting more uh, quantum. So suppose you have just a discrete space, okay, just the same space, endpoint space. Then you have two probability uh, vectors of length n. So these are just your classical states, mixed states on on this endpoint set, right? And then a transport plan would be any. Uh, well, classical state in x times x, which have fixed marginals. Okay, so if you trace of the second variable, you will get the pa, and if you trace the first variable, you will get pb. Right? And then, well, it's um, it's a matrix. It's a, it's going to be n by n, but you can somehow uh, well, you can you can just take it and make a probability vector of length n square, that's that's uh, equivalent. And then what you can do, well, you can just put it on a diagonal of a, of a matrix, of an n square by n squared matrix, and you call it a coupling matrix, okay? It's nothing special, you're just rewriting things. Uh, but then if you have a distance function on, on your endpoint set, uh, so you can again have a matrix. So you just take your, so this is an, n by n matrix, right? Uh, which encodes the different distance. So it, of course, it's gonna have a zero on the diagonal and it's going to be symmetric because it's a distance. Um, then again, you can do the same trick. So we can just make it like that and turn it into a vector of length n square and put it on the diagonal. Okay, so we have a coupling matrix, which is an n square by n square matrix and you have a diagonal cost matrix which is again an n square by n square matrix. And then you can rewrite your classical optimal transport problem uh, as follows. Okay, so well, actually here there should be a row AB, but it's it's equivalent. So the, classically, you need to optimize over all transport plans. So over all these joint probability vectors uh, with respect to a given distance. And, but you can rewrite it in this way so that it's it's a nice matrix formulation. And all the matrices here are diagonal. Okay, both the coupling and the cost. Now, of course, the point of going quantum is to go off diagonal, okay? Uh, so, okay, yeah, one more thing about the Wasserstein distance. So, uh, yeah, if you plug this formula for, to the general formula for the Wasserstein distance, well, Again, you can rewrite it in the in the matrix form. So we have the pth power of your. So to have a Wasserstein distance of order p, you need to take a pth power of this diagonal matrix, 
and uh, well, you do the minimization, minimization, and at the end of the day, you take a teeth square root. Okay, and again, it's a it's a nice distance on on the space of all mixed states. Okay, so for instance, if you have a a simplex geometry, which means that uh, well, any two points are distant by well, I have distance one between them, unless this is the same point, then it's zero, of course. Uh, so this is the simplex geometry. Then your cost matrix is actually projective. So if you take any power of, of it, uh, positive power of it, it's going to be the same matrix. So then the Wasserstein distance is just, well, it, it's just about this pth root, okay? Because the, the cost matrix is the same. But that's only for the simplex geometry. If you have something more general, uh, well, then then it's not the case, uh, and this is going to be important in the in the quantum case as well. Well, and of course you can you can consider any other cost matrix, any other diagonal cost matrices that you you would like. They need not come from a distance, but then in general you won't get a distance. Um, so here we focus on the things that really come from a distance because we want a quantum analog of the of the Wasserstein distance. Okay, so that's a nice picture hand drawn by Carol. <laughs> uh, so that this is the the left left picture uh, is the classical optimal transport problem, the continuous version. So we have a big probability distribution on in two variables, and you have the fixed marginals P A and P B, and then you need to optimize overall these probability distributions, which are compatible, which have these marginals fixed. Okay, in the discrete case, that's the same story. So we have a probability vector of length n square with the marginals PA and PB fixed. And then you need to optimize over all these guys. Okay, and now the, well, a natural idea for the quantum case is that you take all bipartite states which have fixed marginals. So we have two, two states, row A and row B. Uh, and then you say, okay, so now I want them to come from a one global state, bipartite state, which have the marginals fixed. Okay, and then you need to optimize over all bipartite states in a way. Okay, so let's let's just write it down. So, okay, so omega N, I will use this notation for the set of all density matrices of order N. Mm, okay, then you fix two states, can be mixed if you want. Uh, and then, well, something you call a coupling matrix or a quantum transport plan, if you wish, is just any bipartite state such that it has the, uh, the, the partial traces, which, which gives you the, the states that you have fixed. Okay, so this is of course a, a subset of all uh, states of, of order n square, right? And uh, know that it's it's always non-empty because, well, you can always take a, just a tensor product. Okay, so it's, it's always there. And now, well, you can take in principle any quantum cost matrix. So any, so bounded operator on, on C uh, n square. So an n square by n square matrix, a Hermitian matrix. And you formulate the quantum optimal transport problem, which you see looks very similar to the classical case. The only thing is that now, while well, your quantum cost matrix need not be diagonal, it can have some of diagonal terms. And uh, well, your states are also, well, they are not diagonal in general. So Michal, uh, just intuitively, like in this classical setting, this cost, uh, Function was probably non-negative, right? So yes. Uh, so now you allow uh, you allow in principle matrices C that are that can have negative eigenvalues. Yeah. Well. Okay. You are right. It. I should have written that it should be a should be positive a positive definite. Matrix. Yeah. Positive. Okay. Positive semi. Positive semi-definite. That would be okay. 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 Yeah. Positive semi-definite would be okay. But actually, I will focus on a. I will focus on a very specific cost matrix because, um, well, I, I will now tell you a bit about what people did in this in this area and, uh, and well, because that, that was a an old problem. So there was some early attempts by by 
Karol and, and Wojtek Swomczyński. Uh, there the idea was a bit different. So they, they just used the classical mode problem, but for Husimi distributions of quantum states. So there were some coherent states and they, they had some classical probability distributions associated with it. And they were looking for the mode problem for, for it. Uh, well, then, then there was something, well, there still is a big domain in this, uh, let's say, dynamical way of looking at, at the transport problem. Uh, and because there is a dynamical formulation of the optimal transport saying that, well, you have a map which is really has some parameter, which is continuous, and then you can think of, say, state evolving. Uh, so there were works in this direction. Uh, and uh, there's quite a lot of new work on, on, well, more direct using the quantum couplings. Mm, okay, and in particular, so there were different motivations. So, um, well, some people use the semi-classical limit of quantum mechanics. Uh, yes, Michal, you want to ask something? Oh, sorry, <laughs> no worries. Sorry. No, no, no worries, okay. But yeah, please interrupt me whenever you feel like doing it. So, uh, yeah, I think- Also, that... I encourage other participants to interrupt. Yes, of course, of course. I'm not the only one here. Yeah, yeah. So I think this this formulation, that's a very nice formulation by, by Giacomo da Palma and, um, and Trevisan from, well, it's published this year, but the preprint was two years ago. Uh, and they have this idea that, that this quantum transport plans are in one-to-one -one correspondence in with quantum channels. So there you really have this nice interpretation that well, something evolves, right? There's some dynamics going on there. Uh, but the problem is that, well, then of course you won't have the any distance property because if you have the same state and you have just the same state at the end, something that you would like to have distance zero, well, it's not going to be zero because there's the identity channel. And if you well, put your identity channel into under the trace, you, you're gonna get number which is bigger than zero and uh, yeah so they know it's well they knew it's there are some properties which are nice but but they don't have this property that that the distance it, it's not a distance okay um, well there is a distance uh, by uh, again by Giacomo da Palma but with other people with Setloid notably and they had some generalization of Hamming distance uh, okay so that's that's yet another idea but okay, this is the one I wanted to ask about because I think there is quite a lot of interest in that specific mm -hmm. distance because of applications. So, like, what is? Uh, uh... Oh, well, okay. <laughs> what can I tell for sure is that it's it's very different from our. <laughs> okay, they they have a completely different idea. I honestly I don't recall very much the details, but. Uh... Yeah, I don't know. I well, I I can send you the paper. I can give you some details, but maybe not. But, right but, uh, <laughs> but just general, it fits in yeah. the framework of uh, like a quantum transport plan as a global state whose marginals kind of agree, and you just pick some specific uh, matrix C. Can it be understood in this uh, way? Or let me see. Uh... I'm not even sure about that. Well, for sure, this is the case for the for the two previous attempts. So this one and and this one. It might not be the case for the humming distance, though. Mm. Yeah. Well. No, honestly, I yeah, I, I don't remember right now. Okay, it's not. Sorry, excuse sorry, me. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, no, no worries. Please go ahead. I was just, you know, uh, like the yeah, yeah, course, are similar. Well, I, That's why I, I, it's my fault. I should, I should, I should know it, of course, obviously. But this is, uh, yeah, it's just a bit auxiliary to what we did because we there are many attempts and many papers, and uh, uh, well, they they have a distance. Okay, so so let me answer as follows. So they have a distance, but it's it's very specific. Okay, it's not a general something that you would call a Wasserstein distance, which comes from, a, in particular, it doesn't really come from something classical, right? So 
our motivation was to find a cost matrix and to show if they if they exist or not of something that could give you an analog of a Wasserstein distance. Uh, well, and, and we did found a, a quantum cost matrix, uh, which is just a projector and it has the following shape. So you take a, your computational basis and you have the bell state, the singlet state. Uh, well, then you sum over, over all of them. Well, okay, of course. Uh, so in other words, this is just one minus swap normalized. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah. So it's a projector on top of the symmetric stuff. Space. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And uh, well, and this is a natural choice because if you have a projector on the anti-symmetric subspace, then there is a chance that you, if you have the same marginals, the same states, you are going to have something symmetric. So if you take the product of two, then it's going to be zero. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, so the same idea was uh, was considered by by a few people. Actually, we we had it independently. It's only only later that we learned about the other approaches. So uh, in particular, we, le we learned from Andreas Winter that, that they had a very similar idea and they did have some of our results in a, uh, it was in a bachelor thesis by, by his student, Reira. But uh, well, they did the wrong thing to not to publish it anywhere. So, so it's just in the thesis. And uh, yeah, as Andreas said, it's well, it was just playing around. So they had some numerical results, but they didn't really had courage to finish it. Uh, so luckily, luckily for us, <laughs> actually. Uh, but it's it's funny that they they really had the very similar idea and and they thought that well it it might give a distance actually. And then there are some other papers uh, by well this is just a preprint the first one, the second one is is published in some conference proceedings, and it has some application to quantum. Uh, generative adversarial networks, if I'm correct. Uh, again, something that I, I know next to nothing about, but but it seems that, well, people people find some, some interest in it. Okay, so uh, let's fix this cost matrix for a while. And uh, yeah, so uh, your transport problem looks like that. And uh, well, your Thing that you would like to be a distance, you would have a chance to be a Wasserstein distance, uh, is just a pth root of, of this transport because this matrix is projective, it's a projector, so whatever power you take of it, it's, it's just going to be the same. So, so you just have this, the difference is just in this, in this root. Um, okay, so in, for sake of notation, for if I write W without any index, I mean W2, the square root. Uh, because it, it will turn out that the square root is, um, is essential to have a distance, actually. Uh, so at this level, what we can show is that, uh, well, the, this quantum optimal transport cost, so this function on any n-level system, uh, well, it's a convex function. Um, well, it has joint convexity in both variables. Well, it is symmetric, as, as we expected. Uh, it is, it is non-negative for this cost function. And uh, it vanishes if and only if the states, so the marginals are equal. Okay, so one way is fairly obvious because you say, well, okay, it, it should be so that if you have the symmetric uh, matrix and you take, well, take a trace of it with something anti-symmetric, you are going to get zero. And this is actually the, the only possibility for if the states are equal. Uh, and uh, on top of it, it is unitarily invariant. Okay, so that's, uh, very nice property. So at the end of the day, what we can say is that all of this kind of generalized Wasserstein functions, let's say, because it's not a distance yet, uh, it's a unitarily invariant semi-distance on, on omega n. So what is missing here is uh, the triangle inequality, okay, which this is something that uh, that differentiates distance from a semi-distance. So semi-distance is just a function which is non-negative, symmetric, and vanishes uh, even only if the states are equal, okay? Uh, so before I go to the metric property, uh, let me give you some, some nice bounds. So, uh, well, you all know the quantum fidelity between two states. 
and if you have the quantum fidelity, you can uh, you can write down the distances distances on a, on the well, space of n-dimensional quantum systems. For example, you have the root infidelity and you have the Pures distance. So these are probably the two um, most popular ones. And uh, basing on a, on a theorem from this paper, we, we have a very nice bound for, for our, say, Wasserstein distance. So this is the square root of, the, of this TQ. Uh, and it's bounded from above by the root infidelity with some coefficient and from below by the Bures distance. Okay, and on top of it, if you have, if either of the states is pure, it's actually equal to the root infidelity. Okay, so you can make some picture, although at this moment, so it's bounded by two distances, but at this moment, we don't yet know if it's a distance or not. Okay, and we only have a partial answer to that, but well, from this formula, you would guess, okay, it's bounded by one distance from below and another distance from above. So it's, it is likely that it, it really is a new distance. Uh, so you see, you can, well, for this specific class of states, so if you start somewhere here, quite close to the center of the block ball, and then you, well, you go out uh, and you, you end up in, in just uh, plus state, so a pure state. You see that at the beginning, it, it behaves like this Bure's distance, this one half coefficient, but then it turns and for the pure state, it agrees with, it, it coincides with the root infidelity, okay? Okay, so here's uh, our, well, let's say main result. Uh, and uh, well, for the moment we have it for the qubits. So for the qubits, we were able to prove that this thing, the, the Wasserstein function, now I can call it a distance because it really does satisfy the triangle inequality, which means that it has this property, okay? So if you go from state A to B, and then you go from state B to C, uh, then you always get a greater distance than if you go from A to C directly. Okay, so this is indeed a distance for P greater or equal than two. So in particular, if you take a square root of the, of the uh, quantum cost, it's going to be a distance. And if you take a higher root, well, it's also going to be a distance, but it is not going to be a distance if you don't take the square root. So in particular, it's not a distance for P smaller than two. In particular, TQ itself is not a distance. So the triangle inequality fails here. Okay, and uh, okay, th there was a recent result uh, of this um, Jens and Shannon divergence thing. There is also some kind of a, another distance on the quantum space of states. And there is a very recent result showing that it was, I, I know, an open problem for, for quite some time, if it's a distance or not, if it satisfies the triangle inequality. And there is a very recent proof by, by Birostek uh, from, yeah, this year, I think, uh, where he shows that uh, it really is a distance, but you need to take a square root of it. If you don't take it, then it's not a distance. Mm. So you see, it's. Also, it's very different than in the classical case because in the classical case, I told you that if you take, uh, if you have, if you start with any distance function for, for, for pure states, and then you augment it to the probability measures, well, you can take any p greater or equal than one, and you're going to get a, a Wasserstein distance. Here, it only works above two. Okay, we don't have a very good understanding why is it so, but it is so. Okay, so for qubits, we were able to, to ha have some analytic formulas for, the, for this quantity, uh, though not a general one, because what we were able to show is that we have a semi-analytic formula which, which uses the roots of six orders polynomial equation. So we showed that it, finding this minimum, computing it is equivalent to solving a six order polynomial equation, which of course you can do it very quickly numerically, uh, but uh, but you cannot, uh, well, there, there are no analytic formulas for, for it in general. Uh, but you can have analytic results if you take some specific states. So for instance, if you take the, the classical states, so just diagonal with one parameter, um, then you get this formula. So there's a, 
maximum between these two differences. Okay. Uh, and there's also a very nice formula for isospectral states. So you have the states with, which has the same spectrum. Now, because the, the distance is actually unitarily in, invariant, it's sufficient to consider, well, one state you can fix it to be here, and then the other is just uh, rotated by an angle, because then it doesn't matter in, in which direction you rotate, you just rotate. There's just one parameter here, and that's that's the nice formula. So. Uh, it depends on the, yeah, you have the absolute value of sinus here. Okay, and this metric seems to have some nice properties. Uh, in particular, there's a question about the geodesics that you can ask. So a geodesic in this language is something that saturates the triangle inequality. So that if you go from A to B and from B to C, this is exactly the same distance as if you would go from A to C directly. Okay, so that's the definition of a geodesic. Mm. Now, it is known that there are no geodesics for root infidelity and for Bure's distance. Uh, but on the other hand, there is uh, something called the Bure's angle. So we take the arc cos of square root of fidelity. And this guy does have geodesics. And we discovered that there are also geodesics for the transport metrics. And here's how they look like. So this is the... Uh, section of the block ball, the xz section of the block ball. So we have the zero state here, the one state here, plus and minus here. And now, oops, sorry. Uh, and now, if uh, for the Bure's angle, the geodesics are are ellipses. Okay, so these are these dashed lines, right? And for the transport metric, well, if we if we have this, well, we fix this point here. And this, well, we, we, we fix the three points. So that's that's how, how the geodesics lines look like. Okay, so see, it's, it's very weird because they have some kind of cusps here. So it's not, it's not differentiable, actually. It's not a smooth function. It's, it's continuous, of course, obviously, but, but it's not smooth. And uh, yeah, this is probably because of, of this formula that have some maximum, as you see, even for classical states. It's not smooth because there is a maximum. So it's going to jump at some point. There is some uh, non-smooth points of non-smoothness. And uh, well, OK, of course, well, it's a very nice picture, geometrical picture. For me as a mathematician, it's, it's very nice. Uh, well, the question is what it really means. And this we don't know. But certainly, it seems that it's a very interesting metric because uh, because it has these geodesic lines and uh, and it interpolates somehow between the root infidelity and the Bure's distance, and neither of them has the uh, has the the geodesic lines. Okay. Right. So uh, so let me talk a bit about the the decoherence, which uh, well is supposed to give us some intuition. What's the how the quantum optimal transport can be related to the classical optimal transport. Uh, so for a decoherence, you consider, well, you consider your initial state rho, and then you take some parameter alpha, and uh, well, if the alpha is, uh, is zero, you have a classical state, which is just the diagonal of it. And if alpha is equal one, then it's, it's your initial state. Okay, so alpha is actually proportional to the L1 coherence of, of the state rho alpha. Okay, so first result is that the transport of quantum states is more expensive than the transport of classical states, which is, well, okay, it's, I might say, okay, it's intuitive because there is more information, so there is more, well, there is more somehow to transfer. Uh, so, so that's this result. So if you have um, two states um, which are not equal, uh, then the, this uh, transport cost between them uh, decreases with the parameter alpha. Okay, of course, the same would hold for the square root of it. Mm. Uh, but uh, there is a more interesting result, uh, which says that quantum optimal transport is cheaper. And that's a result that uh, actually was derived in, in some more specific context by Cagliotti, Golse, and Paul um, last year. Uh, so the result is the following. So suppose you have a just a, and dimensional probability vectors, then you can treat them as, 
as diagonal states, right? It's diagonal quantum states. So we can embed this classical probability vectors in the, in the quantum um, space of states. Uh, and then uh, if you take the, the classical cost matrix to be the diagonal of the, of the quantum cost matrix, then your quantum optimal transport will always be give you a smaller value than the classical optimal transport between the states. So oh, the intuition here is that you have the same, the same states, whether you call them quantum or classical, it doesn't matter because they are operationally the same, right? Uh, but then uh, this, the, spa the space of bipartite states over which you optimize is larger for the quantum states than for the classical ones. So we have more states to deal with, and that's why you can make it cheaper. That's why you can reduce this cost. Okay, so I think it's it's interesting. Um, okay, so we have a, a refinement of this result. Uh, so we consider the continuous the coherence of this cost matrix. So again, you put some parameter alpha, so that if you if you take alpha equals zero, it's just the classical cost matrix. Um, um, oh, sorry, this is from the previous slide. It shouldn't be here. Uh, well, oh yeah, okay, of course. It's it's always true, again, that this is proportional to the L1 coherence of, of the C Q alpha, because that's an operator. But it's not a quantum cost matrix, okay? So it, uh, it doesn't uh, verify the, yeah, it's not, it, it, it need not be positive semi-definite. Well, anyway, you can, you can have this matrix. And then what you do is that you just take the, the classical states of order two to start with. Uh, and then you take a trace with this cost matrix depending on the parameter alpha. And then what you learn is that this function, square root of it or without square root, that's the same, is a strictly decreasing function of alpha unless either of the states is pure. Or of course the states are equal because then it's zero. So that's a nice picture. Uh, so we have the, the classical transport cost is here, the black line. Okay, so you see if the states are equal, so it's, it's a distance between this state, 0 0.3 and 0 0.7, and t varies. So you see if they are pure, then everything coincides here and here on the ends, at the ends. Of course, it's everything is zero if you just take the same state. But otherwise, this guy is always above. Okay, so, and, and this red line is the quantum optimal transport. So then you see that the, the coherence takes, well, it's, it's quite harsh. So if, you, if you're only at the half, you're much closer to the classical case than to the quantum case already. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so just one more mathematical thing. Um, before I go to the to the conclusions, so uh, yeah, I told you at the beginning that you can take any quantum, well, you can take any cost matrix, something more general. Here we had specific results for the swap, uh, but uh, well, in, in in for qubits, there's there's nothing more actually because that's the only uh, sensible cost matrix that that is there. But uh, if you go, well, I mean, coming from a distance on the space of states, because of course, otherwise you can take anything. Uh, but if you really start with a distance, there's nothing else than a simplex distance, right? Because it's just a rescaling of it. But if you go even to dimension three, you can have a geometry of a triangle or you can have a geometry of a simplex and it's going to be different. So you can consider a kind of quantization of this classical distance. So you take this as a cost matrix and this again is a nice cost matrix uh, in the sense that we are able to show that it's uh, for any dimension, uh, this cost matrix will give you a semi distance on the space of states. Okay, now is it a distance? When is it a distance? This is an open question. Well, we did some numerical study and first, first results that are reassuring is that if you take this uh, projective, because this is not a projector anymore in general, okay? Uh, if you take this projective quantum cost matrix, uh, the, the square root of the 
cost. So something that we would call the Wasserstein quantum Wasserstein two distance is really a distance. So we checked it for n equal three and for n equal four. And we are fairly convinced that it should hold for any n. But if you go to other geometries, this is more complicated. So we have some partial results saying that for some distance, for some classical distances, you will get a corresponding quantum distance, but maybe not for all of them. So this is an, an open problem. Yeah, OK, so uh, let me conclude with this, I would say, pertinent question. What quantum optimal transport might be good for? What is the, the right interpretation here? Because, well, it's a nice mathematics. Uh, but uh, yeah, so first thing is that well, classical Wasserstein distances are useful for, for just comparing probability distributions. So that, as I said, it, you don't really need to think in terms of, of moving, say, portions of probability, but just comparing the things. And this has many applications. Now. There might be some, some applications for state distinguishability, uh, because if you have this, well, Bure's distance, for instance, as far as I know, is used in quantum metrology. Uh, well, it gives you some measure of how the states are far from, from one another. So here we have, uh, we don't really have a fidelity, but we have something like a kind of a swap fidelity, because if you, if you just consider this, uh, the trace of your bipartite state with a swap operator, it plays the same role as fidelity plays in the say root uh, in fidelity. So this is something that, well, we don't have a clear vision here, uh, but we hope that this might bring a, uh, some application, some possible application. Uh, and uh, well, apparently people are interested in, in this kind of structures in quantum machine learning and the quantum, um, well, I, I know it's general, it's not general, it's ge generative, I think, adversion networks, I think so. Uh, so there are some, some papers by, by Lloyd and by others, but this, frankly, I, I don't know very well or uh, at all, should I say, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, and uh, well, if you have any nice idea how, for instance, to use this fact that quantum optimal transport is cheaper, because for now, honestly, it's just a slogan. It's, it's just a slogan saying that, well, the cost is lower because you have a larger space of states. Uh, but yeah, I have the intuition that it, it, there should be a way to, to, to use it somehow, because you have the classical states on one end and on the other, and you can do something better so the, the question is what is better is it the time the number of steps or anything so if any one of you would have some nice ideas we would be very very happy to discuss uh well thank you for your attention uh, thanks uh, Peter, for, for a nice talk uh we have time for questions and comments Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, I know okay, it's I have mathematical, but yeah. I, I think it was all right. No? Like the, like it can be like much more, like stuff can be much more technical, of course. Uh, so just uh, general questions. So uh, often uh, those distances used in, in quantum information, they they, set, they, they have some funny properties when you, I know, combine systems like subtle additivity or mm -hmm. the, like when you apply some quantum operation to quantum states, like they, they, they have this data processing inequality. So yeah, yeah, yeah. do you, like, does, uh, does your distance satisfy this? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thanks. So we're, uh, we started looking into, into the question whether it's a, it's, it's a monotone with respect to quantum channels. Uh, well, for the moment, we're just running some numerics and it seems that, well, we have two votes against one on three who say that it's, it is. Uh, but among the authors or among numeri uh, numerical <laughs> results? <laughs> the one is, uh, 
I actually I'm convinced because there is a student, there is me and there is Carol. Carol is maybe not so much convinced. The student who does the numeric says that, well, it looks like it. And I'm leaning towards his opinion. But of course, we need we need more than that. Right. Right. But uh, yeah, so that, that's an interesting question. So we're, we're looking into it. And then um, as for Sabbath the TV, so let me also say that, uh, well, this is in, in this second paper of ours. So this is, so this is, let's say accessible. So that's, uh, well, it's now under review in PRL. We will see what, what comes out of it. And uh, the other one is a 60 pages long mathematical paper and it's now in. Not accessible. You don't recommend well, <laughs> I mean, for a starter, uh, I would recommend the first one, certainly. But then if you're interested in details, then you need to go to the second one, of course. Uh, but uh, yeah, so one thing that we did in this extended paper is uh, we have an n-partite quantum optimal transport. So instead of just having two marginals, you can have a, an n-partite state and you have the n marginals, which are fixed. Okay, and, and again, there you can have something like a, this projective cost matrix, so just a projector on the anti-symmetric space. And, uh, and then it also is a, uh, is a semi-distance in an appropriate But like, uh, I'm a bit confused when you have many states you are comparing, yeah. so distance typically is about two objects, right? So now, yes. so it's like some measure of similarity between Tuple, like yes, among but... members of tuples. Of, of, of... Yes, 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 exactly. So for any tuple, it's, it's like that. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah, but then in in this in this n-partite case, you can you can probably start asking these questions about uh, yeah about about dativity and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. I mean, what I mean is like you can have a single system which is composite system. Yeah. Right, and then this larger one would be even like. Even that, like a, it consists of four systems then, mm -hmm. two for each. Uh, right, so, okay, one more, okay. Just regarding the, the, the I mean, partially motivated by your remark about the application. So, uh, like, so I, I, I guess this, like one of those works, I guess, I guess about one Wasserstein distance, uh, distance, this one that, mm -hmm. uh, that that's one of the works that you quoted by this uh, Da Palma person. Yes. Right? Yeah, I so it's, uh, I guess, what? like some up, I mean, just for the fact you remember, it, it was useful, like this distance was useful because it allowed to, I don't know, bound some, changes in expectation values upon some local perturbations to your system. That's why people got kind of to, to your state, right? Yeah, that's, 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 right. that's why I think that's, we're that's interested the because the, it's... Yeah. This was the one with the generalization of the humming distance, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but this actually, yeah, I, now I remember I, I looked into it, but I don't see any, any direct Mm -hmm. the connection with with what we did it's um, just a different sure. <laughs> right okay one more comment so like personally i'm a fan of this those distances in quantum information that are kind of built on the top of classical distances between probability distribution so you know you have some you know quantum protocol uh that that like like two quantum protocols that give you uh, to probability distributions, and then you optimize over some, you know, in the case of states, you are kind of optimizing, uh, you are measuring them via some key of EM, and you are optimizing, like, there's, like, statistical distinguishability of mm -hmm. uh, probability distributions in the output. So, question, like, did you think about, so, so here it's also possible to, to do it in principle, so you, you, you can do, you can start with a, Okay, it will be a bit elaborate construction because you will start from this classical Wasserstein distance mm -hmm. to compare probability distributions, but those probability distributions will be coming from quantum states that you measure in some way. So, like, yeah. and that, that is another way to, to define like a quantum analog of Wasserstein distance, I guess. Mm, yes. Uh, 
I think this is more in the spirit what Carol did with, with Wojtek Swarczynski at the beginning. So starting with uh -huh. coherent states and relating it to, to semi distributions. And then you consider the classical. Thing. Sure, but you can then look for like the map, you can look for, you can first do just compute probability distribution, like compare via Vashelstein distance, and then you optimize over okay. like over the over POVMs, for example, right? Mm -hmm. But wh wh so. where do you get these probability distributions from? So you from measurements of quantum okay, states. So you have the via... and... Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. And then to Wasserstein on the top of that. Yeah. I'm just... Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Uh-huh. Yeah, I see. I mean, okay, just... I'm not... I, I haven't thought about that, no, but that's an interesting idea, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Enough of my comments, guys. Like, if you have like some, some further questions, please. <laughs> yeah. So let me just add more, one more comment because this you might find interesting that it's actually it's also a, a proof. It's it's in, in this paper uh, that uh, this quantum optimal transport problem is an SDP problem. It's, it's, uh, ah. Oh, th this is an interesting one. Yeah. Okay. It is an SDP problem, you can... Ah, right, right. Okay, I see, because it's uh, just marginal, st like, uh, you optimize over the, like, a global state of, like, yeah. like well, set of states that have uh, fixed marginals is, uh, is an uh, SDP. It's yes. given by SDP. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it follows from some general results. It's not a... Sure, sure, sure. Ah. But then, in principle, you can, I know, use, I know, SDP duality to, I know... Ah, so you can... Did you try to run the dual of that? Yes, we do have the dual of it. Actually, we needed to go through the dual to prove the triangle inequality. So ah, for was, qubits. That was fairly tricky, yeah, yeah. yeah. But to the dual for, cub, uh, for qubits. For the qubits, but we have a general formulation for... No, no, sure, 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 but the triangle is for the qubits, I remember. Triangle right? is for the qubits. Okay, okay. Cool, cool. Uh, but this dual does it have some interpretation? Because sometimes yeah, this is this is what I what I was thinking about. Well, I I don't have it here on the slides, but uh, yeah, you see, um, in this dual problem, but okay, in this dual problem, you have um, you can think that you have two local observables, like let's say sigma a and sigma b. And then you can you can interpret this this minimum as a because it's dual, so it goes to the supremum. So it, you need to take a supremum over all these local observables, sigma a and sigma b. Mm, uh, but then, okay, of the so this you you need to take a trace of the sigma a rho a plus sigma b rho b. Okay, so this you can think in terms of having just row a b and having the sum of traces of uh, sigma a times one plus one times sigma b okay i would need to see yeah. the formula yeah. sorry yeah. anyway <laughs> you can i think the, the punchline is that you can think in terms of optimizing local observables which would be really nice mm. uh, but then the problem is that that these observables are constrained by by this cost function and this is something that we don't understand i mean it's a weird condition saying that some c minus uh, one times sigma uh, minus uh -huh. sigma b times one should be greater or equal than zero should be positive but can one i don't know maybe one can understand this as I, i'm just hypothesizing as kind of how much expectation values over some class of observables like differ among because yeah. yeah i think this right? is yeah th that would be right but uh, the problem is how to define this class of observables this is what we don't understand it certainly depends on the cost function uh, but we don't have a clear clear interpretation here but yeah the okay bottom line is oh. that we do have the dual problem so it's again opens i think there are a lot of Roots a lot of paths that are interesting to explore, and hopefully some of them will find some applications. So, 
If you uh, come up with any, please feel free to write me and I'll be. Okay, thanks. I tried to check out your paper. Sure. Okay, uh, last, uh, last chance to ask something to Michal. As quiet. As quiet. Okay. If uh, if there are no more further questions, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks, Michal, for joining us.